Good evening and welcome everybody. We'd like to welcome you to the culminating event of the Reynolds Speaker Series. We're absolutely delighted that everyone is here tonight. Um, we're here at Wagner, the School of Public Service, and I'd like to acknowledge Dean Allen Shaw, who's sitting up in front. Uh, without her, this program would have been quite different and we appreciate her support. Um, <laughs> Also here with us tonight is Gabriel Brodba, who is the program director. Um, Gabe is here with his team as well, Nate Taylor and Zainab. With Gabe and the team here at Reynolds, a lot of us who are part of the Reynolds program probably would not have had the privileged, transformative journey that we've been on in the last two years. So we definitely want to thank you and the team that's around you. But I'd also like to introduce somebody who's extremely special and without whom this entire program would not exist, Mrs. Catherine B. Reynolds. <laughs> no, <just a> <laughs> I want to do justice to Mrs. Reynolds before she comes up and tell you a little bit about what she's meant to me. Um, as a woman and as a social entrepreneur myself, I should have started by saying my name is Maho Khodi Makhene and I'm a 2008 Reynolds Fellow. Um, I came into this program and I can honestly say that the last two years have been some of the most pivotal moments in my life and so much of this is owed to Mrs. Catherine Reynolds and the vision that she's had. One of the things that I'm always extremely proud to share with people is that the Reynolds program was founded by the vision and entrepreneurial zeal of a woman. It's through her success, her commercial success, that we're able to sit here and more just as importantly to me and to everybody else in the Reynolds program is the vision that she's had as a social entrepreneur. So she lived the first of her years as an entrepreneur, but she came into her own really as a social entrepreneur. Um, we emulate this and we celebrate the way in which she's decided to create, to inspire, to catalyze, and definitely to empower the next generation of social entrepreneurs. Um, I'd also... So now I'd like to ask Mrs. Catherine B. Reynolds to come up. Good evening. Thank you for that very sweet introduction. Ellie Wiesel. Ellie was only 15 years old when German troops deported him and his family from their home in Romania to the concentration camp of Auschwitz. His father, mother, and younger sister all died at the hands of the Nazis. As a young boy, he survived forced labor, forced marches, starvation, disease, beatings, and torture to become a world-renowned writer, teacher, and spokesman for the oppressed. He is best known as the most eloquent witness to the great catastrophe to which he was the first to give the name Holocaust. After the war, Ellie was determined to tell his story to the world. His book, Night, is the classic account of the Holocaust. Since its publication, he has written more than 40 books. Throughout his life, he continues to be the voice for victims of oppression all the world over, recipient of the Nobel Prize for Peace and our dear friend, Ellie Wiesel.
my dear Catherine and Wayne and good friends, how could I, who could we say no to these two persons who have done so much in the field of education and humanism in this town, in this world? I know what the subject is to speak about morality, but I will try to tie it into a story. After all, I love stories. And the story is, once upon a time, somewhere in Eastern Europe, where I come from, a man came to his master and said, my dear master, I have a problem. What is your problem? He said, I am forgetful. What is it to be forgetful, said the master. He said, master, it's very simple. Whatever I do, I forget. Imagine I go to sleep in the evening, and next day in the morning, I don't know where I had put my clothes. And the master said, it's very simple, my dear. Do you know how to write? He said, yes. Do you have a pen? Yes. Do you have paper? Yes. In the evening, write everything down. He did. Before going to sleep, he said, my shoes are under the chair. My pants are on the chair. My shirt, another chair. In the shirt, I have a piece of paper, which is very important to me. It's there. I have, and went on and on and on. Went to sleep, is very happy. In the morning, he found a piece of paper. He said, my shoes are under, yes, they are there. The, sh the shirt, there. The uh, pen, there. The notebook, there. But at the end, l last night, he wrote, and I am in bed. So now, when he had found everything else, he looked in the bed, and he wasn't there. <laughs> So he came to his master, he said, Master, it's, you, your advice is very good, I found everything, but where am I? This is the question we all are asking ourselves and each other. Where are we in this world? This world is a strange world, has always been from the very beginning, but this time even more so. We really don't know where we are. And we don't know because we are like looking a compass. Of course, Marion and I believe the ethical compass, but even the historic compass. Where are we? So many changes, so many convulsions, so many tribulations, so much turbulence. What is happening to the world? And things are coming and they are not even foreseen. Take them among the most important uh, events that took place, let's say, in the last 30, 40 years. I'm not even speaking about the two world wars, is what? The collapse of communism. No one had foreseen it. Not a single intelligence service in the world had foreseen it. We spent in America a hundred billion dollars on intelligence. And we have not foreseen one of the most important events, the collapse of communism. Uh, we went, Marion and I went to the Soviet Union many times. Before, I had gone even before, before I was married. If anyone had told me then that I will witness the end of communism, I wouldn't have believed it. We went to South Africa in the late 70s. Why? Naturally, to go for place to place, from community to community, university to university, to speak against apartheid. We were then among the first to plead for Mandela's release. If anyone had told us then that we shall see the end of apartheid, we wouldn't have believed it. And even now, what is happening? What's happening now in the Middle East? Everything is coming and it's not foreseen. So what are our experts doing? What are the experts in? Maybe they are experts in not knowing. <laughs> now, when we went to South Africa, and we worked trying to, 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 to liberate Mandela, of course it didn't work. Later on, many, many years later, we organized, after I got the Nobel Prize, we organized in Oslo, a Nobel conference, and we invited Mandela, who had just been freed from jail. 
We also invited the minister from the apartheid government, because we invited there about conflict resolution from all aspects. But we made sure that that minister had nothing to do with, with torture and so forth. We had Mitterrand from France, Havel from the Czech Republic, heads of states around the table. Uh, at one point, the minister of the apartheid spoke and said, Nelson, we have never met you and I. But I want you to know that I grew up in apartheid. I believed in apartheid. I believe that human accomplishment for us is through apartheid. Now, all I want, all I wish, is to attend its funeral. And because it was so beautifully put, so poetically put, I, who chaired the session, stopped it and took both of them into a room and said, talk to each other. And that was the beginning of the end of apartheid. So certain things that are not foreseen that are good. I'll give you another example. Many, I think the year 2000, the German government, German parliament actually left Bonn and went to Berlin. And they invited me to come and address parliament, which I did. I was there, of course, with Marion. And I spoke. I can imagine that you imagine what I said. In Berlin, where the laws were, were perturbed, poisoned. When the victims had nowhere to turn to the police. The police was criminal. And I spoke gently, but I told them the truth. At the end, I turned to the president. Johannes Rao was his name. I said, Mr. President, Germany has done great things since 1945. First, it became a democracy, a functioning democracy. Bravo. Second, you joined our people, I mean, the United States, people that we believe in, our democracies. Third, you have helped my people. The survivors received money from you and passports from you, and you, you helped Israel. One thing you haven't done, you have never asked the Jewish people for forgiveness. Why didn't you? You can imagine the silence in that hall. Little did we know that a week later, he picked himself up, took his plane, and went to Jerusalem, to Parliament, and officially asked the Jewish people for forgiveness. Wasn't foreseen. I think he hadn't foreseen it. So there are certain things that are foreseen that are bad, others are good. It all depends on us. And here we come to the subject, actually, of the topic given to me. We called it, actually, the ethical compass. And it came not from us teachers. It came from you students. And Maggie, actually, was one of those who, whose, whose essay is in the book. I think the first book, number one, in the book. What is it? It's actually, we organized a national, uh, national uh, project for students, a competition to speak about ethics in their lives. And the prices were good. First, first prize, $5,000. For a student, it's not bad. <laughs> the second one is $3,000. Third prize is, at, I think, $1,500. Incredibly, we received hundreds and hundreds of essays. We have juries, but experts, professors. And these essays are their views, their hopes, their aspirations for ethics in the world. Because after all, this is something that we cannot do without. 
Ah, yes, a teacher of IT, literature, and philosophy, and religious studies, whatever. I never repeat a course. But whenever we finish a book, my question to the student is always, what is the book about? What is it about? And usually, the answers are always around ethos, which means, where is the place of ethos or ethos in, in, in Greek in this novel or in this essay on philosophy, metaphysics? What, how can a society live and progress and flourish without fear if that society is not based at least on a, on a thirst for whatever is ethical in life? Now, what is ethos? Of course, first of all, it means a choice. The choice is always there, between good and evil. And that choice exists since Adam and Eve were in paradise. So there it was a very simple choice. All they had to do is eat from a certain tree. Today, you have to read many, many books, listen to many, many lectures, meet many, many people in order to come to a certain to a certain realization that this is good and this is not. So how can one make such a distinction? We know what is not good, surely not. Apartheid cannot be good. Racism cannot be good. Antisemitism cannot be good. Dictatorship cannot be good. Why? Because they all imply the humiliation of the other. It means I do not respect, if I believe in racism and so forth, I do not respect the otherness of the other. Because the otherness of the other is something negative, something strange, something alien, something which cannot be me. Of course, therefore, I believe that cannot be an option for anyone who believes in ethics. For on the other side, I, for instance, I love the otherness of the other. I love to see a person, any person, as a stranger. When I was a child, I loved beggars. I adored beggars. I loved them because they all had stories to tell. And I would come actually to say, tell me a story. And they would say, give me a piece of bread or cake. So I, I, that I already did business. <laughs> And I remained with that. I also love madmen. When I was in Paris, I studied philosophy. But part of that, of, of that study meant or implied also a, a, a minor, so to speak, he would call it a minor, in psychopathology. So I would, for two years, I would go to a great insane asylum in Paris, Saint Anne, for two years, I think twice or three times a week. I love them for their stories. Little did I know then that I would use these stories in my novels. Little did they know, I think, but, but anyway. So what is ethos? The ethos is to respect the other for whatever the other is. To see in the other not only a means to redemption, but also a vehicle for the language which calls for redemption. The means become a goal. The dream becomes the real reality. Because, again, I expect from the other the same thing. Now you would say that means paradise. Take the other side, take a dictatorship, be it Nazi Germany or communist Russia. What united them? Both of them were dictators, Hitler and Stalin, and I don't compare them. I, I compare nobody to Hitler, not even Stalin. And both, of course, had exercised total control of every single person in their lands, and not only on their behavior, but also on their mind. They were convinced, and they wanted the other people to be convinced, that they have the absolute truth. 
and nobody else has, only they. Stalin on one hand, and therefore fanaticism had a capital, political fanaticism was Moscow. Hitler believed the same thing, and his capital was Berlin, and that was a racist capital. Just as we had capitals in the Middle Ages, religious capitals, fanatic capitals. Now, Stalin, for instance, you know, when he published, they published uh, every year an encyclopedia. Every year, the content changed. Let's say in the beginning, Trotsky, who was, after all, the, the, the founder of the Red Army, but he became the arch enemy of Stalin. But in the beginning, he had 10 pages. Then only six. Three, three years later, nothing. 16 years later, a page or two, but treating him as a traitor. The same thing happened actually with Hitler too. He ordered the murder of his people, the night of the long knives, for instance. His people, the greatest Nazis, the greatest fascists, were killed in 1934 by him, personal orders. He even went to see how it was executed. Don't look for ethos or ethos in their language, although they speak about it. Both Stalin and Hitler spoke about the good of the people, naturally, and of the world. Stalin wanted actually to save the world through communism, which became a, a, a laboratory of deceit, falsehood, and torment and torture. And Hitler did it through Auschwitz. What do we learn? What we learn really is everything is in our hand. The choice is always in our hand. Uh, even the SS, the worst of all that we can imagine, at least in Europe, they were voluntary. We forget that. Not, it wasn't simple for a, for a soldier to become an SS man. It was a voluntary act. And it was for him a privilege to be accepted almost until the end of the war. The same thing in Russia with the Communist Party. All the judges, all the prosecutors, all the hangmen had to be communist members. From inside, they believed that what they were doing was the good, for the good of humanity. Which means everything can be corrupt. Everything can be perturbed. Everything can become cheap and cheapened, everything. I mentioned fanaticism. Usually we spoke, let's say, about religious fanaticism for so many centuries. Does it mean religion is so bad, so ugly? No. It depends what you do with it. Religion is like love. It depends what you do with your love. It can be ugly and cheap, and it can be beautiful, the most beautiful experience and ambition that a human being can feel, young or old. So where are we in this world? We in this country live in democracy, a good democracy, the best in the world still. And all of a sudden, he, we, we who believe that America is a peaceful country uh, is involved in three wars. And we hadn't foreseen them. Three wars. And yet, a year ago, we felt, well, we have to get out of Iraq. Then, out of Afghanistan. Now we have to get out of Libya. Hey, we go places. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, when you see, last night, Marion and I watched a documentary about the great hunger, the great famine in the Soviet Union, 1920, 21, 22. I think more than 20 million people were died of hunger. And they, they brought us evidence that there was cannibalism. People ate. 
corpses. Mothers, I can't even say it, ate their children to feed other children. And who helped Russia? America. Literally, America, only America. With Herbert Hoover at the head of that operation, America almost sacrificed itself just to help Russia, which later became an enemy. What does it all mean? That history is not made by destiny. We make destiny. And therefore, it's really our choice. If we want destiny to see to it, that I would see in every stranger a companion rather than an enemy, then may God bless that destiny. And you students, on your shoulders, we place not only our hopes, but our memories. Thank you. Good evening. Um, it is such a privilege to be here in this room with you, and thank you so much for your presence here. Um, my name is Anurag Gupta. I'm a second year Reynolds Fellow from the law school. And um, I really was touched by what you had to speak because you started with this beautiful story um, of South Africa where two opposing sides were sitting, the oppressor and the victim, whatever you want to call it, and the apartheid um, um, party member was able to see the humanity of Mandela and was able to really undo the otherness of the other. My question is for you is more personal. I know that you've taken so much, I mean, strides to overcome all sorts of emotions um, with respect to the Holocaust and all sorts of oppression that exists in the world. And as young people in the world now who will be living in this world, the gift of history, um, what recommendations or advice do you have for us to really follow the ethos of love that you've so beautifully crystallized in your language today? Thank you. Above all, above all, really, what guided me is a very simple principle to develop a passion for learning. And I still have that passion. After the war, people used to ask me occasionally, how do you explain the fact that you are still alive? And I don't know the answer. Believe me, I haven't done anything to remain alive. Uh, we always, occasionally, my wife, my dear wife, asks to me, I, because I am so clumsy, I am so helpless, that she said, how are you, I don't understand how you managed to survive. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but in truth, I have never done anything for it. I let myself be, that's all. As long as my father was alive, of course, I lived for him. But afterwards, I don't know. But one thing they didn't ask, and I think which is more important, they could have asked, how did you manage to keep your sanity in those places and afterwards? That. And there I, there I have an answer. When I came, I, 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 we came to France in 1945. 
No country wanted us from Buchenwald. And General de Gaulle opened the gates for us. And I went through four uh, orphanages. In the first one, immediately, what I asked for is books. A passion for learning, which has accompanied me literally since my childhood. A passion for learning. And I would say to you young people who, of course, will never go through not even a spark of the fire that consumed so much of my life, nothing. But you will have, you will have tests, challenges, even moments of suffering, despair. Never forget that, that whatever you do, whatever, wherever you turn, let what you do and what you seek to get become a source for that passion the passion for learning. And I think that will show you that you can never learn alone. You need a teacher, you need a friend, not only books, more important than books, is people. Mr. Wiesel, thank, thank you so much for joining us and embracing us with your presence. My name is Daniel Saad. I'm a NYU student here and a Reynolds Fellow. Um, my question for you is around, <clears throat> is around shared memory. I grew up as a Jewish child in the States and had some of my most profound memories listening to Holocaust survivors tell us their stories. And it troubles me deeply that the next generation, my children, may not have the same firsthand experience um, to, to, to receive that transfer of memory from, from another generation. And I just wonder what, what wisdom you can share with us all who have shared your, your memories in, in moving that forward. My young friend, uh, what you ask, of course, is, is our concern. Uh, survivors, I call them an endangered species because their number decreases daily. And I know that soon, who knows how many years, someone will be the last. I don't want to be that one. But one thing is clear. First of all, this event is, ha is better documented than any event in history, religious or secular. What do you mean? Hundreds and thousands, if not millions, of pieces of evidence exist. Evidence given by survivors, evidence given by victims, by children, by old, by religious, by atheists, even, even by the killers themselves. We have from them more evidence than they were ready to give, but we found it. Second. I do believe that he or she who listens to a witness becomes a witness. And therefore, that almost statue of witness can be inherited and can become a legacy, which means you who now, at least for a moment, you heard someone who wants to remain a witness. Now you are a witness. Thank you, Mr. Riza. I want to say um, thank you for being here and thank you for Catherine and Wayne for the opportunity to be here and the honor to be able to address you tonight. My name is Claudia Perez Pellicer. I'm an alum of the Reynolds program. And I'm actually, I was born in Cuba, but I've lived most of my life in Austria. And I think reading Night when I was in, in um, middle school was one of the most pivotal, pivotal texts that I've read in my life. I wanted to ask you about healing. I've recently come back from a visit to Cuba. I've been very involved with what's happening there. And, and I wanted to ask you as a survivor, how do you suggest or how, do you, how can you conceive healing? How can you conceive healing as an individual after what you've seen and what you've experienced? And how can you conceive healing truly and permanently as a community, given that atro atrocities not to that extent, but in many different ways are happening around the world today? There are many ways and many methods. Uh, individually, 
Individually, I think it's really in the domain of, of psychology, psychiatry, but socially, it's much more different to me. Socially, if you become involved, first of all, is to become involved. Almost to leave your own inner social structure in, in, in order to join someone else's inner social structure. That's number one. That helps you, first of all, because you think of the other more than of yourself. But as you also ask about collectively, I don't believe in collective guilt nor in collective innocence. You can imagine I've been asked this question many, many times. What do I think about the Germans and so forth and so forth? And I don't believe in, in collective guilt. Only the guilty are guilty. I have occasionally students who come from Germany to, to study with me, and they are the best. And they are being received by the other students in my class with such tenderness that I am moved more than I can tell you by the fact that my other students understand my teaching. And strange, these young students are innocent, but they feel guilty. And they shouldn't. Their grandparents, some of them are guilty, but they feel innocent. And they shouldn't. <laughs> Actually, I wrote a novel on that, which just appeared here, called The Sonderberg Case, a conflict between two generations, a grandfather and his grandson. But that is a problem. And e in each case, I repeat and repeat and repeat. Innocence and guilt are personal attitudes. They belong to each other. And only the guilty have to be naturally criticized, condemned, and the innocent should be praised and helped. Um, thank you again for coming and speaking with us today. Um, my question is about, I really liked when you were talking about accepting the otherness of the other. And just in today's world, we see so much of um, looking at the other in terms of their um, proximity to resources. And it's hard, there's been a lot of controversy over why we entered Libya rather than Bahrain or Syria. Um, and I wanted to know what you think about um, how our governments view the other and um, I guess more, if you think that governments can look at others um, beyond their proximity to natural resources? Look, I know the criticism on both sides. I read the same papers that you do. I don't agree with any of them, but nevertheless, it doesn't matter. Right or left, I don't agree with them. That's my privilege not to agree. But look, the critics say that America only came to help where there is oil. There is oil in Libya, we go to Libya. In Ivory Coast, there was no oil, there is no, although there was now an intervention yesterday and today, France and America. When the president spoke about Libya, I confess to you, I love the speech because he spoke not about politics, but about morality. What did he say? He said, I cannot stand by while uh, there in Libya, the, uh, Gaddafi is killing his own citizens. And he repeated that. I cannot stand, hey, I like that. I have myself in my entire, again, my adult life, and I became involved in human rights, for instance. What do I say? What, what is ethos to me? It is a commandment from the Bible. Usually we praise the Ten Commandments. Nobody listens to the commandments. But nevertheless, they know at least there are ten commandments. The real commandment to me is the eleventh commandment, or twelfth, or thirteenth, which says, thou shall not stand idly by. I remember when I was in Bosnia, uh, I went sent by President Clinton, 
uh, in Bosnia. Somewhere, in one of the camps, a young doctor came up to me. And she is from New York. And she said, I am here now for already a year. I closed my office, she said, because I read one of your statements. And the statement is not yours from the Bible. Thou shalt not stand idly by. A week later, I was already here. I, I was so touched by her, I almost embraced her, but I, I, I was thinking of my wife, so I didn't. <laughs> <clears throat> but the fact is, this is the great thing. And when the president says, we cannot stand idly by while they are killing, bravo, Mr. President, good. Because he didn't care there about politics. His arguments were not political at all. On the contrary, I think it hurt him more than it won, let's say, friendship and support. But he said, I cannot stand idly by. This is what we should learn. We should not, we should never stand idly by when people are killed or tormented or victimized. You said earlier that when you were young, you, uh, you used to love the beggars because they had great stories. I'm curious if, uh, did you always want to be a writer? Or what did your experiences through the Holocaust uh, want you to share your stories to, for the better good of mankind? No, I always wanted to be a writer, actually. But I, I even wrote. Uh, but I, I didn't write stories. What I wanted to be actually is to write commentaries on the Bible and the Talmud. And I, I, that's what, that was my life was. And I found recently, uh, my, my oldest sister died last year and her son found <coughs> in, her, in his mother's apartments things that belonged to me, writings, and a little notebook dated with my stamp, my writing. And these were <coughs> mystical thoughts about some biblical events. I was 13. So here I am, <coughs> excuse me, writing and teaching. And this is what I wanted to do all my life, writing and teaching. But I'm not writing the same thing, and I'm not teaching the same matters. I all, only I hope that one day I will find the real subject and the real treatment for that subject. Who knows? Thank you. I'm curious how your Judaism, your faith, impacts your, comp your ethical compass and how that faith <coughs> might guide mm. your actions and how you see the world now. Look, if you read night, I'm sure you have many questions about it, about my faith, because I'm being asked everywhere about it. How can you go on believing since, and what is the answer? My answer actually is an evasive answer. What is the alternative to say to God, Mr. God, I divorce you? I cannot do that because I come from a long line of, of uh, Jewish teachers and I cannot do that to them. So I, I, my faith, I, I define it in my first volume of memoirs, All the Rivers Run to the Sea. My faith is there still, but it is a wounded faith. And I actually compare it, this saying to a saying uh, by a very great, great, great Hasidic teacher, Rabbi Nachman, who was one of the great, great storytellers in our tradition. He said, no heart is as whole as a broken heart. This is when you see misery and suffering, and you cannot help their victims. Your heart is broken, but that makes it a very whole and maybe holy heart. Thank and you. that goes for faith as well. Thank you. 
I've been really touched by everything that you've shared with us tonight, and thank you for the tremendous opportunity to be here for us. Um, my name is Christina Arnold, and I'm a 2010 fellow in the Reynolds uh, f Fellowship. And um, <coughs> I thought, in particular, what was very um, intriguing in what you were discussing is this this issue of mind control. How how many people seek to not only control bodies but also minds. And uh, secondly. If you had anger about everything that happened um, to your family and, and in your lifetime, what happened in your experiences, how did you find peace with, with that? Number one, I never, never felt hatred. I was spared. I don't know how, but I never felt hatred, not even towards what we call the enemy. Maybe because I felt sick right away and I had other problems, but I never had hatred in my heart. Anger, yes. Anger can be productive. Anger can produce a great work of art. Music, painting, like Picasso. You can, but no hatred. So the main thing is therefore, if and when and anger enters your heart, let it become the beginning of something generous bringing you closer to others rather than move you far away from others. Good evening, sir. Thank you again for being here. Uh, my question pertains more to um, what you said about ethos and the other and how um, we can guide ourselves by well, whether or not we are respecting the otherness in the other. And I was wondering if you saw sort of in, I guess, the age of globalization and social media, and we're seeing, as we're becoming more and more connected, and really in a, in a globalized economy, um, where I think being closed-minded actually makes you the loser. Um, is this like an avenue for uh, sort of a greater interconnectivity and understanding, uh, or also within that understanding and sort of proximity to others, are we in danger of losing our uniqueness and our diversity um, as, as sort of everything becomes so mixed? And is that a good or a bad thing? There is, it's simple. I, I believe in a word which I like. The word is encounter. I believe in encounters. There is a mystery being created between a person and another for a, min for a minute or for a year or for a lifetime. Something is happening there. When the same words can be used by one and the other, and nevertheless, the meaning is different, and nevertheless, those words bring them even closer together. And therefore, look for that. The same thing can go with a text. You may read a page in, a, in an ancient book or a modern book, and that is, gives you the opportunity to have an encounter with those words, with that encounter, with the vision of that author. And that enriches your life. And then it depends on you whether the enrichment of your life would bring some happiness or truth to another and not only to yourself or the reverse. Again, the choice is still yours. Thank you. Yes. Hi, um, sir, I just wanted to say personally, thank you just so much for coming here and blessing us with your words of wisdom wait, from Wait, wait, I cannot hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. One second. Wait, wait, the ambulance must go away. Okay. Please, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say firstly a quick thank you for just coming here and just blessing us with the words of just someone who has lived so much more life than like most of us have. And I guess my question is about your views about love. I know that you were, you were, um, you spoke a lot in your speech about the ethos of love. And I was just wondering if you think that we can truly talk about love without also talking about God, because I know that in the Judeo-Christian tradition, it says that God is love. And I was just wondering, um, what are your views on just human love versus God's love, or if you like, or if you believe um, that God's love is still a force in our world. 
my young friend, I, I, I am Jewish, and I come from a very religious, almost mystical background. And therefore, of course, God is present to me. And when I speak about love of God, it's a kind of mystical love. But for this, we would need more time than enter the area obscure and enlightened and luminous of mysticism. As for love, human love for each other, believe me, I have been married for 42 years. And uh, our love has not diminished, just the opposite. We have a son, we have two grandchildren. And you should see us with our grandchildren to realize that love is very much part of everything we are and we do. I think we are coming to the end. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll finish it with a story. Thank you very much. You may sit down. It's a, it's, it's a story which is marvelous, really. It is not in mine. It is, I think it was written by a Russian writer called Andreev. And the story is the following. Somewhere in Russia, a child, eight, ten years old, turns to his mother in the kitchen. He says, Mother, do you know what I will do when I grow up? She said, No, I don't know. He says, I will go dedicate my life to find truth. Oh, good, she says. <laughs> <laughs> but then he said, but mother, I, you must tell me. I will try. But what is truth? Otherwise, I may find it and not even know that I found it. So she said, oh, my dear child, truth is a very beautiful woman, young, dark hair red lips, blue eyes. And when she speaks, her voice is like the voice and the sound of a violin. He didn't answer. He kept the image to himself. And they came, days came, days went by. Weeks came, weeks went by. When he was 18, he came to his mother in the kitchen. Mom, I came to say goodbye. What? I have to leave you. Where are you going? I told you, I'm going to find truth. But are you crazy? What are you doing? I have to go. I promised you. He left her. He went from city to city, from country to country. He met many beautiful women, but not truth. One day, one night rather, 30, 40 years later, he was in the desert, very tired, lay down. And while he was lying down, during darkness, all of a sudden there was an apparition before him. Opened his eyes, a woman. The ugliest woman he had ever seen in his life. No hair, but straw. Lips dry. Eyes extinct. Who are you? She said, don't you recognize me? You were looking for me. And he said, it's impossible. My mother told me that you are the most beautiful woman in the world, and that your eyes are blue and dead. What, what can I do, she says. That's who I am. Then he said, lady, I am young enough, although I am old, to go back to my town. My mother may still be alive, if not she, at least my friends. And I must come and tell them that I found you. What should I say? And she said, oh, my dear child, do me a favor and do yourself a favor. Tell them a lie. <laughs> no. Don't tell them lies. Except make truth be a human truth, which means capable of beauty, always, no matter when, always. Thank you. <laughs>